the Holy Gospel according to Luke, the fifth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Once, while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Genesaret, and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there on the side of the lake shore. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats and one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put it out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down, and he taught the crowds from the boat. When he finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water, and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long, but have caught nothing. Yet if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and they filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. You may be seated. Just look what God is doing. That's exactly what we are still being led to do in these weeks after Epiphany. When we were last together, the heavens were declaring the glory of God in Psalm 19. Every bit of creation was in awe of what Jesus was doing as the Word made flesh spoke read and lived the word amongst the rest of humanity. One day, reported to another day, you aren't going to believe what God did yesterday. Hang in there, because as you know, when God touches something, it's never the same. Jesus certainly put word into action now, I warned you a couple of weeks ago that there would be consequences for some of those words of truth. I told you his own town folks would try to chase him off the cliff, and that was last week's lesson. Sundays and Seasons, I'd like to introduce you to this book today, is a worship resource that we use here at St. Matthew, both the book form and the digital form. Augsburg Fortress, the printing arm of the ELCA, provides these resources. I love the introduction that Sundays and Seasons provides as a recap for this week's Isaiah, 1 Corinthians, and Luke texts. The fifth Sunday after Epiphany continues to highlight unlikely instruments and circumstances appointed to reveal God's glory. Who will go for us, God asks. A person of unclean lips, we get that out of the Isaiah text. A former persecutor of the Church of God, and who is that? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And three fishermen who couldn't catch a thing. More surprising still, perhaps, is that we are also calm. And in the commentary portion of the resource, the Reverend Melody Eastman, a pastor from Illinois, reminds the reader that Jesus, who is seen as one who has teaching authority, the fishermen refer to him as master when they see him, is an unlikely candidate to tell these unsuccessful professional fishermen where to cast down their nets. Jesus has a lot of nerve to tell Simon to go further out to get some fish. At first glance, this rabbi does have a lot of nerve. 
These guys had already pulled their boat and their nets in after a long night. They were tired, as we hear. They had nets to tend to. Perhaps all that seaweed and that other undesirable stuff caught in their nets, everything but a fish. But what Jesus always demonstrates about the glory of God, and listen closely to this, but what Jesus always demonstrates about the glory of God is that when God touches something, it is never the same. These disciples who are being beckoned by Jesus to follow him are going to see God revealed in all the ways that you and I know from reading the gospel text. They're going to find out firsthand that the work that Jesus does is going to flow through their own hands. God will touch fish and bread and it will multiply. And the disciples will be actively involved in the distribution of the meal to thousands of people, one person at a time. God will touch withered hands, and they will straighten. God will give the disciples the ability to walk amongst the villages and do the same. God will touch the unclean lips of these followers. In much the same way that the prophet Isaiah was touched from the throne of God in heaven, and the living word will flow through them and be introduced to those who need to hear it in God's timing. Even people like the Apostle Paul, who persecuted the church in his first career, are called to deliver the living, breathing good news that will change lives. This familiar phrase from Paul, but by the grace of God I am what I am. And his grace towards me has not been in vain. Look what God is up to. God makes this beautiful world and desires to be in relationship with it. Once God touches something, you know the rest. It is never the same. God puts that love into action and desires for all of creation to live fully in that love. And God, through Jesus Christ, the unlikely candidate, Jesus Christ, the unlikely candidate, calls us the most unlikely candidates to live in that love and redistribute that love. That's what God is up to. This past week, I got a text from a former co-worker of mine. I learned that one, a person that we worked with, a former co-worker, someone my age, had passed away. She and I sat not too far away from each other in the corporate office cube world. And you get to know somebody pretty well when you sit with them in cube world, if you've ever done that before. I noticed in the obituary that one of my colleagues was to officiate at her funeral service. I called that pastor on Thursday morning because I wanted to have a chat with him and relay to him some stories about her public witness that I thought would be helpful for the family to know. She was a person who often struggled in life like every one of us. But there were key moments that I recall when she spoke of her faith and took on popular stands in the office. Those weren't always the most well-received moments. And I can personally attest to not being too happy with her on occasion for some of those God moments. Let's just say that in reality, our relationship was not exactly rosy. One thing that my cube mate did that always stuck with me, though, was she took one of our co-workers under her wing. You and I would most likely immediately identify this particular person as one of the least of these in the world. Here's a phrase that might sound familiar, an unlikely candidate. 
She walked the walk with her. They would occasionally head out for coffee together. She stood for this other and helped her to have a voice in the midst of office politics and helped her to find her way in this world and find her way in her faith. My pastor friend has been ordained for over 30 years. And I didn't realize that he was my co-worker's pastor when she was a young adult many years ago. He remembers her growing in the faith. Wow, what a moment. He also shared some moments with me about how God worked in her formative years. It became suddenly clear to me that there was sort of a Psalm 19 thing happening there. One day was reporting to another day what God had done in the first part of the saint's life, and another day was reporting back to one day what had taken place in later years of different pathways. A story that neither one of us knew fully until we articulated it. There was an incredible moment of grace unfolding as our conversation evolved. Indeed, her family needed to hear about these moments on just two of the pathways in her life. An important piece to take away from this is don't be afraid to tell the story. God is working in our lives and we don't always know how that, that that fits in the grand scheme of things. I believe most of the time we don't tell the stories because we as the Church of Christ have this idea that we all have to be perfect saints with no flaws and our stories have to have storybook endings and they all live happily ever after as the movie ends. And the Christian walk, my friends, is very rarely that rosy. Can we all agree on that? Amen. In this particular case, we didn't get along that great. <laughs> it certainly wasn't Mother Teresa and St. Peter working together. <laughs> the Apostle Paul is trying to impress this upon the church at Corinth. Paul isn't happy at all about his early days and how he persecuted the church. Do you really think all of that was forgotten by the church and by Paul at the snap of a finger? Do you think there was never strife in the church? One of the reasons we have the epistles is because there was always strife in the church. And Paul was not perfect. He was the first to admit this. He was an unlikely candidate. He was a thorn in the flesh. Paul sums it up best. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me has not been in vain. He tells how Christ died, and how Christ was buried, and how he rose from the dead. He tells a story about how Christ appeared to his followers. I love how he tells that some of them are living and some of them are dead. Christ lived. And Paul even describes how Christ appeared to him. Christ appears to each of us. The Word made flesh. Christ lives within each of us. And all along, in each of those stories, there is an example after example of imperfect, unlikely candidates that the Word made flesh works through the hands and the voices and the lives of 
Included in that list is you and me. Grace abound. What a story to tell. I beseech you, children of God, to see and hear and smell and taste the ways in which God has touched your life and the life of those around you. I beseech you to tell that story. The more you tell the story, the more you and others learn of what God has done. Look what God has done, what God is doing, and what God is about to do.